my name is pushkar i work as a sub project maintainer in kubernetes sec security the sub project's name is tooling so anything related to security that we do for kubernetes are we good on audio i i hear an echo okay all right so anything that we can do by writing code or helping people write code uh, that is going to improve security for open source kubernetes is what my sub project le uh, lead responsibilities are uh, and then the other things are i end up helping out other sub projects etc we will have a couple of folks who will help you out if you get stuck especially tabby who is our chair for sec security who is graciously come out to help out uh, so bit more about me uh, if you saw the photo on the previous slide i am in the sfb area one of my favorite places to go for a car ride is mendocino county which is what the sweatshirt is from um, i really love uh, the coast uh, like i said uh, apart from sec security i am also a tech lead for cncf tax security great question to ask what's the difference between tax security sec security during the breaks or after the session uh, i am also recently uh, associate uh, member for kubernetes security response committee so any time you get a cve uh, a notification or we are one of the people who send it out to the rest of the community i am formerly a staff security engineer at uh, vmware tanzu uh, like i said i love the bay area i also i love many things that start with c uh, so cycling chai indian curries camera and cricket if anybody follows we have a world cup going on uh, and you can find more about me on the link on the slide so we will divide it into small blocks uh, so that we don't get overwhelmed or get really tired at the end of the session uh, this is the intro section we'll have 20 minutes for the first task including the 5 minute break 25 minutes for the second one with 5 minute break included and then 30 minutes with 5 minute break included eventually at the end we will wrap up and i'll share some links for further reading if you want to continue to explore more and more about this so uh, just by raising your hand how many of you are on mac os right now if you are going to follow okay perfect i have tested this on mac os so most of you should hopefully be able to uh, follow along uh, how many of you are on m1 uh, mac os okay uh, all right and intel okay cool so there is in the install prerequisites part there is a small change for people will have to do for once on m1 basically instead of darwin amd 64 binaries you will be ensuring darwin arm 64 binaries so we'll talk about talk more about that anyone on windows or linux computers or virtual box okay cool so we have similar setup for linux and windows binaries as well i haven't been able to test it but even if it breaks uh, or doesn't work for either of you all the scripts that we will use will be available publicly after this session forever uh, you will also ha have access to the recording of this session so you will be able to follow along the demo videos even later so don't be afraid if something doesn't work uh, how many of you were able to look at the session description and install the prerequisites mentioned in the link okay perfect if you haven't installed that's also fine we'll spend some time to install it uh, and only thing i would suggest is if possible use docker desktop on mac windows on linux environments really like docker binaries are also fine uh, but the main important thing is please don't run any of the scripts on production servers or shared computers because this is a lab things could go wrong and we don't want other people to suffer because we were trying to learn something good so as long as you're running this on your personal laptop with docker desktop we have an added advantage of it everything running in a virtual machine that docker desktop has included by default so things would be 
much safer if you're running Docker desktop. And again, don't run this in production, even for folks watching online later on or watching live right now. So now back to the actual content. Uh, if you, uh, how many of you are security people and how many of you are like ops admin people? Uh, security and ops admin? All right, some, some of you are both, which is fine. I'm also both. Uh, many times when people ask, how do you want the security to be uh, for your system? Everyone says, secure by design, it should be built in versus bolted on. It should be transparent and it should just work. Uh, and I think the one thing people whisper, which is, can it be cheap? So, because nobody wants to spend lots and lots of money securing things. So this is exactly the part that we will do today. We are not gonna ask you to install anything paid. Everything we will do is open source, part of Kubernetes community. Most of the things we will do are actually part of existing Kubernetes releases. So without really installing anything apart from what's available open source, we will try to secure as much as we can for all the clusters that we work on. Anyone who is a complete newbie on Kubernetes or uh, has just been playing around for like a couple of weeks or so? Okay, that's, that's totally fine. Uh, don't feel bad in case something doesn't work or ask questions if I am missing something uh, in terms of giving context. Uh, and you can always continue to try this later on. And anyone who is familiar with Kubernetes, uh, if I repeat something that you already know, just be a little bit patient and I'll quickly move on to some more advanced stuff. So we'll focus, like I said, on built-in Kubernetes security features. All of this is mostly work of Kubernetes community. Uh, since at least since I've been here in the last couple of years, we have tried to do a lot of things uh, in Kubernetes where the security can be part of the project versus being reliant on other things that we need to do. So we'll divide, like I said, in three tasks. First task is how do I verify signed container images? How many of you know we have been signing uh, release images of Kubernetes in the last couple of releases or so? Okay, that's good. So now you know for folks who don't know. Uh, and the idea behind signing is essentially you want to trust whatever is being sent by Kubernetes release. And that's the reason why we're signing. And all the focus on secure supply chain doesn't hurt doing all of these things. Second one is how do we enforce baseline pod security standard? So anybody using PSPs? Port security policies, anybody tried port security admission? Yeah, so we're actually gonna try in do, using the port security admission and enforce the existing baseline port security standard. We are also going to work on seccom filtering. So all the container runtimes, uh, like container D, you know, we have another helper, Nadir, who is gonna help you out in case uh, you get stuck. All the container runtimes like container D, cryo come up with their default runtime uh, seccom profile. What we are going to do is let Kubernetes actually use that because by default it doesn't know that I can actually use the runtime profile. So we'll see how that works. Some prerequisite knowledge, uh, knowing basics of curl, file redirects, file editors, I'll try to go through it in a way that it is clear, but uh, ask questions if needed during the break, or even if you have a small question, we can do it during the session. Uh, with the lim time we have, I may not be able to answer all the questions or like unblock everybody in all the tasks. So it's okay if you are halfway there and we have to move on. Uh, we, we can always continue later, follow along uh, for the rest of the task. You can run the scripts later on because all of all of the th things that I'll do here will be available for you later. Kubernetes basics, what are namespaces, pods, images, uh, those kind of things would be great to know. A prerequisite tooling. So for folks who installed it, great. 
for folks uh, who want to install it, I would say uh, at least have Docker installed. There is an install prerequisite script that I will show that will install most of the other things. Uh, but see if you can install Docker uh, by yourself right now. Uh, use the five minute break to relax, also ask questions. And I'll be hanging around after the session as well. We have lunch break, so it's really up to us how much we want to talk, uh, but happy to answer questions later. So now let's get started. So this was the link in the session description. If you have uh, sked.com access or the Kubernetes schedule access, you should in the session description of this session, you will find this link. Just run this command, git clone uh, the URL of the repo, and you'll be able to download it with all the scripts that we are going to use today. So now let's go back to doing the demos. I'm gonna quickly mirror my display so I can see what you're seeing. And let's go here. Is the font small, big? Is this better? All right, cool. So like I said, this is the uh, GitHub uh, repo. Everybody been able to find the URL so far? All right, okay, cool. Uh, and this is where you can basically also find the URL and do a Git clone. Now going to install prerequisites. So remember for M1 folks uh, with Mac OS, in this section, basically anywhere you see AMD 64, and AMD64 here, just change it with ARM64, and if you run the script, it should work. So going a bit deeper into the script, basically what it's doing is uh, setting up this so that we know when something fails in bash. S uh, next one is setting up paths so that when we install a few things, we can use it as a command line inter uh, prompt directly. Uh, this is for uh, different uh, operating systems. So when you run the script dot slash install prerequisite, just add an argument for your operating system. So Windows, Darwin, or Linux, and then it will pick up the binaries that you need. So let's pick Darwin as majority of you are on Mac. Uh, what it is essentially doing is downloading the kubectl, which is the client side uh, interface for interacting with Kubernetes API. It's installing Kind. So for folks who are not familiar with Kind, Kind stands for Kubernetes and Docker. And what essentially it's doing is, I have a cluster. Uh, I want to play around with it, but creating a cluster is hard. Maintaining it is even harder sometimes. So this creates test clusters using Docker on your laptop, and you can essentially use it as a test environment. So we will use that quite heavily, especially in the second and the third task. If you're familiar with Kind, most likely the, pre the whole uh, tutorial, especially the second and third, would make a lot more sense. Uh, but I am hoping that at the end of the tutorial for folks who haven't been introduced to Kind, you'll actually fall in love with it and use it after the session on your day-to-day -day jobs. Don't run Kind to run production clusters. Use it for test environment and development only. Uh, and so that's pretty much it. So I've, I've installed this uh, already to um, make sure the Wi-Fi doesn't break. I've been informed that the Wi-Fi should be uh, pretty good, specifically in this room. So hopefully when you run this script, it should work for all of you. Uh, but start running it. The basic idea of running this would be pretty simple. So I have this installed here. Is the font okay for the people at the back? Yes, okay, cool. So I, will, I won't run it, but basically it will look something like this. And if you click enter, you'll, it will install Cosign. You'll see a lot of things getting installed for Cosign because it's using go install. And then eventually it will start installing kind and kubectl, which will be much quicker. So uh, take, take some time, let it run. Uh, while you're um, looking at the slides next, let the script run. And by the time we are ready for the first task and actually implementing things, 
uh, hopefully it will be installed by then. So everybody uh, start installing this uh, and let it run. We'll switch back to slides until it is installing. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so um, I didn't have Xcode installed. Okay. So this is a heads up if you're trying to like, install the Xcode. Tool. Yes, that is a good idea. So one thing I would also recommend in true open source fashion, the repo is public and any things that you find that could be improved in the rep repository, uh, like adding Xcode as a dependency, please create PRs. I would love to hear from you. I would love to see uh, all the work that we are doing here be useful for everyone later. So add PRs, maybe now, maybe later. And one more thing I wanted to show is for now as well as for later, if you are stuck and it's hard to like share what is wrong in your terminal, what error it is exactly face to face, uh, one thing that I've set up here is if you click new issue, it will give you a issue template. You can still, okay, you can still see this. So it will give you an issue template, uh, help me debug. And if you click on this, uh, you will be able to basically write all the things that are going wrong on your uh, machine right now. Uh, and you can put it down with the description. How did you, re can you reproduce? And uh, if you have any screenshots, you can put it, but really it's optional. Logs would be great and which environment you're running. So I'll try to see if I can follow along on future issues as well. If you, when you try this at home, uh, this is definitely not a, something I'm being sponsored for. So I will do my best in my personal capacity to answer questions later on. But even during the session, if you want to share something uh, and probably many of you are facing same issues, creating this kind of issue would really help. So please use this as much as you want uh, just to Repeat, go to issues tab, click new issues and get started and then add any errors that you have. We'll take a look at all of the new issues we create during the break between the two tasks. All right. So we talked about install prerequisites. We talked about how to share, how to share when something is going wrong. So now let's go back to the slides. All right, so the first task. All right, essentially uh, for folks who are not familiar with uh, cryptography and what, how to use it, I'll just give a brief idea as an analogy. If you have a passport, it is basically given by an authority that everybody trusts. And because everybody trusts that authority, uh, when somebody shows like this is me and see the name and the face matching, you trust that the person who uh, is showing this is actually who they are. So that's the main idea of signing and verification. And uh, the stamps for what it's worth are like attestation to your images. So signing all, always happens where the makers only have the private key. If the private key in a public private key pair is compromised, essentially there is no value in anything that's signed by that compromised private key. The verification can be done by a public key, which as the name suggests can be public. And that can be used to verify whether somebody who signed it was actually the holder of that private key. It tells you where the artifact came, came from. So in case of Kubernetes release images, right? Uh, it will let you know that Kubernetes release actually signed these images and when you verify it, you'll see an email address that belongs to them. And because it is verifying using the public key, that's the other side of the pair of the private key owned by release team, you know it's actually signed by them. The next one is how do we actually get all the images in a release? So how many of you have seen the software bill of materials, which is called SBOM you know, of a Kubernetes release? Okay, not a lot, okay. So it's quite big and it's huge as you can imagine. Kubernetes pretty much depends on many, many things. Uh, so we have a way to access SBOM of any specific release on this URL, sbom.kh.io. 
And what I'm doing here is we have a constant uh, which keeps changing based on a new release when it comes up. Uh, and we store it in uh, this specific URL, https dl.cates.io release latest.txt. If you want uh, the latest stable release, you just change latest with stable.txt. So latest would have alpha releases, beta releases. Stable will only have that are officially released, like 125.2. And then slash release is when you will know that now I'm getting the S bomb of this specific release. So the dollar curl will actually uh, look like, let's say, 126 dot something. And it, you will get the S bomb of that specific release. The next one is package name registry.cates.io. So Cates, by the way, is abbreviation for Kubernetes. We, you'll see a lot of it. Uh, the registry.cates.io is the registry where all the Kubernetes release images are stored. And what we are looking for in the S bomb is get me all the images that are part of the release. And then essentially we do some bash magic and get a list of all the images uh, in a file called images.txt. So after that, we take it as input and essentially run a for loop. Uh, so while fs read hyphen r image is going to run a for loop on every single line of the uh, file, and every single line represents one image. So it will loop through all of them. It will verify all the images. And then uh, this cosine experimental equal to one, that's the, the most important part. Even if you ignore all of the other things, this is where you know that you're actually verifying things. So cosine experimental equal to one, I won't go into too, too many details. Uh, essentially for now, consider it as, a, as the standard way Kubernetes release has decided to verify images and in background cosine experimental is essentially using something called keyless signing where i don't have to worry about maintaining my private key or public key um, the six store uh, service is going to help me and keep the private key secure as well as uh, the public key will be available uh, whenever we have to verify it there are ways to do do this with, a, with a, where you have access to private key and public Right now for the releases, that's what we are doing. So then we run a command called cosine, which is one of the things that you're gonna install in the prerequisites, and then verifies the command name. Registry.cage.io is the registry, and then kube API server is one of the images that we are actually going to verify. So if you want, uh, try running this uh, by yourself, if you have installed cosine by now, and if not, we will actually be running this live in front of all of you in case you're facing any issues with troubleshooting. Uh, feel free to call Tabby or Nadir. They might be able to help you out. But if you get stuck and can't move on, that's totally fine as well. So let's say switch back to the demo. All right, so hopefully the prerequisites are working. Now, if you see, we are here. And we are going to go in this. Oh, oh, yeah, good point. Thank you. OK, how about now? Better? All right. People at the back? All right, cool. So we are going to go in this directory. And if you see here, we have the images.txt file downloaded. So let's look at it uh, for as an example of how it looks like. So if you see each line is an image, like I said, uh, the tag is actually the release. So like I said, because we're using latest.txt, it's going to pick up any release instead of the officially released Kubernetes releases or versions. So this one is using an alpha version of the upcoming 126.0. Every release, regardless of whether it's officially a GA version or not, will be signed and you can verify it. So we have about 15 plus, I want to say, images in total. And you can see every one of them is for different architectures. So we have AMD 64, ARM, etc. Now let's try to run this. 
okay so the the script that we are going to run is essentially the same as the ones we saw on the slide uh, if you want to confirm that i'll just show it to you quickly so same thing uh, except the first four lines which are standard for bash to make sure like if anything is going wrong we know and then uh, the idea is uh, after this we will see a lot of output that shows that we are verifying so brace yourself for a lot of text on the command line once we run this but we'll go through some of it one by one and hopefully all of it will make sense oh okay so cosine command not found so why this would happen for you also is if you go here and install prerequisites what i'm missing is i have cosine installed but i have not set up this path so if i go back and run this i can try and see okay cosine is working so now i will go back and run this so like i said lots of text it's essentially trying to share all the metadata that you can get about all the images and it will run for about a minute or so depending on wi-fi and it will it is basically doing the same thing for all the images verifying it one by one and now it's pretty much done so let's look at what it's actually doing so if we zoom it out a bit verification for registry uh, dot cage dot io q proxy md64 that is what it is actually verifying the the thing it's trying to do is are is the whatever i'm claiming it to be like i'm claiming that my image is signed by cosine it's verifying whether that's true first second it's trying to do is are these claims also in my transparency log so without going again into too many details with the usage of keyless signing you end up being able to use transparency logs where you are able to use the public key that will allow you to verify things folks who are maybe more familiar with six store cosine than me feel free to correct me uh, any certificates were verified against the falsio roots so again it's part of the six store ecosystem and then the main thing to look at here is what uh, image i am trying to verify so this is the sha of that image that i am trying to verify and if we scroll down a bit more this is the interesting part so the private key is mapped to this particular account that is owned by kubernetes released engineering team so if you see it's called krl iphone trust kids dot release engineering dot prod and it is a basically a google service account so this gets linked to the private key and as a result of it only somebody who has access to this account is able to sign it and as a result of that because we can see here that this is the account that's being used to verify it we are able to know for sure that it's actually signed by kubernetes release okay makes sense so far cool okay anybody got this running like i did on here okay all right i see some hands this is probably going to be one of the easier installs and the other ones if you have kind and docker would be uh, simpler if you don't have kind or docker it might uh, take a while but that's fine so the same thing happens essentially every f uh, for all the images and that's how you get what we saw so now how are we doing on time uh okay one second i'll extend again okay so about half half hour is almost done so let's take a five minute break before we move uh, if you want to stretch drink water ask me questions just close your eyes for a bit that's fine um, make sure to come back in 5 minutes water should be right outside the rooms uh, and if you have questions i'm all ears and i'll repeat the question so we don't have to move around taking a mic for the people in the virtual attending virtually
Any questions so far from what we did? Go ahead. Can you speak a bit louder? There was a long running command that we had to run. The long running command uh, for verifying the images or the, the, uh, the big output that we saw? Oh, that was the install prerequisites uh, command. Okay. So if you have installed the prerequisites before, then you don't have to do it. But otherwise, it would basically take a while only because cosine takes a while to download. Other things should be fairly fast. OK, I'm back here because people won't see me in the video if I'm standing there. So any other questions from anyone? Anyone stuck where we can help you? Uh, anyone has put any issues in the GitHub link that we shared? You have? Okay, let's look at it. It's the same thing I talked about. Okay, all right. So, great. I think that's always useful to see for folks watching online. So, anyone with macOS who doesn't have Xcode at Win140, so I'll just use your GitHub handle. Uh, has suggested how you could install Xcode before installing all the other things. And take a look at this link if anyone is struggling with the same. Any other questions? Anybody uh, stuck that we can help anything that felt like can merit more explanation? Go ahead. Speak louder a bit more. Right. Yeah. So, uh, how many folks are familiar with public key infrastructure, like how private key, public key works? Okay. All right. So, we can go quickly like a three minute summary uh, and see how it goes. So, essentially, it's like I want to let you verify that what I'm claiming is true without sharing anything that is secret. So how do you do that? And essentially, that's where the private and public key pair comes into picture, where I will not share my private key, but I'll give you an option to verify that I am the only holder of the private key. And what Cosign essentially does is it creates a framework for all of us to use that. So anytime we do a release in Kubernetes, we will use the private key that release engineering team owns to sign the image. So once it's signed, uh, the signature gets stored alongside the image. And then when you want to use the image, you can choose to verify it like we did. And when we verify it, essentially, again, Cosign will use the existing six-store keyless signing to find the appropriate public key and then use that public key to confirm that the images are actually coming from the release team or not. So that's essentially what the whole big output looks like. They, most of the other things are metadata about the images. The main thing to look at was the identity of the signer, which we looked at, which, which was that email address of Google service account. And that's basically how it works in, in summary. Any other questions? All right, let's move on to the next task. So. All right, so the next task is about pod security standards and how to enforce it. If you have been using pod security policies for a while, they are essentially gone from version 125. We have deprecated it since version 121. Many people from SIG security and SIG auth, which is another SIG, as well as many other SIGs in Kubernetes have worked for multiple months to make sure this deprecation and eventual removal process is as convenient and simple for anyone who is an end user. 
So hopefully you are aware by now that we have removed it and it's been deprecated for a while. Anybody using pod security policies, there was actually a great talk on how to migrate from an existing set of pod security policies to something like the pod security admission that we have, which happened yesterday. Uh, I attended it, I really loved it. They also explain uh, something of a policy migrator tool that they have created, which will allow you to figure out what PSPs you have and what you need to do to make sure it runs with the new pod security admission. So the link is in the slides. It should be on YouTube with all the other talks soon. So make sure to check it out. I think anyone using that will actually benefit from it. So this is, I, I love analogies if you know me and I felt like instead of going into depth of looking at the YAMLs of all the pod security standards, this might be the best way to explain what they are. How many people either still commute or used to commute before pandemic to their offices? Wow, there are a lot of remote workers, looks like. Okay. So if you commute or went to school in the past, or the main idea is you want to be there safely and as quickly as possible. Same thing goes with pods and workloads that you want to run. You want the pods and the workloads to be safe and you want them to essentially do the job that they are defined and asked to do. So if you think about it, there are three modes of uh, commute. I have used all of them uh, at some point in time. In my opinion, and obviously everybody's experience is different, be being on a train and going to some place feels the safest to me because I don't have to depend on my driving skills, which is very important. Uh, second is there is a lot of uh, less chance of some other train coming in front of me and we getting into an accident. So that feels safer and basically what this represents is the most secure, highly restricted configuration of pod security standards, which is actually called restricted. The second one is baseline, which is somewhat of my current commute, where I go through a very complex set of streets and roads, where we have bike lanes, where we have trams, where we have uh, people driving through in their cars, through buses, and that feels about right because it can cover a lot of people and the way people commute, but there are some things that they're doing well. Like if I am in a bike lane, I feel safer than not being in a bike lane. If I am in a tram, I feel safer that I have a dedicated route there. So same thing for bus routes also, but it's still not as safe as you would feel if you were in a train. And then the last one is privileged, which is basically like driving along the beautiful freeways that we have here. And if you have a car of yourself, you have all the things that you need in your car, then you're pretty much well set. But not everybody can afford a car. Not everybody has a car. Uh, so sometimes if I can, cannot imagine myself biking on this particular highway, the one in the photo, because I would be very, very scared. So. If you have the means to do it, it is great, but probably it's only great for you, and I wouldn't share the road with any other types of workloads, which is what privilege is, which is basically anything goes, you're on your own at your own risk. So that's what pod security standards are. They are opinionated, only three, because we can't cover all the different permutations and combination of pod security fields. And from lowest to highest risk, they are restricted, baseline, and privileged. So port security admission is the replacement of port security policy, which is built in Kubernetes. It is enabled by default as of version 125, but it's not enforced by default. So the feature is available, but you cannot use or benefit from it unless you configure which particular standard you want to use in your cluster or namespace. Uh, the setup is similar. You can set it up in a cluster, regardless of which standard you want to follow, or you can set it up per namespace level as well. 
And uh, let's look at how to set it up in this specific tutorial. We'll focus only on how to set it up at a cluster level. Uh, focus on the colored lines. Those are the most important ones in the slides. Essentially, this is a configuration in kind, which is defining an admission configuration. So we use a lot of admission controls when you, we use Kubernetes. And what we are doing here is setting up an object called podsecurityadmission.config.cage.io. V1 is saying that this particular feature or API is GA or stable. And the defaults, if you notice here, we have three pairs of lines. So first one is baseline. And if you see enforce version is latest, so you can configure it for an older version, even if you're running a version like, let's say, 125, but you can configure it for an older version also. Uh, but we're gonna go with latest for now. Uh, and then restricted and again restricted. But if you see the last two are audit and warn. So enforce, audit and warn are the three modes in which the pod security admission can be used. And then we have something called exemptions where you can say, I want uh, this particular user to be exempted from all the standards that I'm enforcing. I want a runtime class. Maybe you have a Windows workload or maybe you have something else that doesn't work well or you don't want that particular node to use pod security standards, then you can exempt that. And then namespaces is basically, I don't want this namespace to be under the cluster level pod security standard that I'm enforcing or warning on or auditing on. Uh, so this namespace could be, for example, for all the privileged workloads in your entire cluster where you, are, uh, you have to run some workloads in privilege. And if you put it all in one namespace, you can just exempt it. And for all the other workloads which are running your business applications, you can enforce it at cluster level. So I talked about three modes. Basically the enforcing mode is, I'm going to fail the pod creation if any of uh, if the pod security standard that I've defined in enforce mode uh, actually uh, is not meeting the standard that I have defined. So if I am right creating a pod and it doesn't meet the standards of a baseline pod security standard, it, the pod creation wouldn't work. Same thing for restricted, same thing for privileged. And warn and audit are somewhat similar. The main difference is the audience of the, both the modes. One, in, one is going to warn the user who is trying to create the pod. So when you're running kubectl create pod, you'll get a warning when you're running it saying, well, we have set this standard, let's say restricted in one mode, and your pod is going to be created, but we are going to tell you that if restricted was enforced, your pod would fail because you're missing these things in the pod spec. And then audit is similar, but it will actually log that same warning or similar in spirit in the Kubernetes API audit logs. So if I'm, if I'm an administrator of a cluster, I want to see all my users of the cluster, if they would be able to create pods if I convert all of my pod security standards to enforce mode in restricted. I can set the audit mode in, for restricted standard and then I'll start getting API server audit logs for all the pods that get created and which ones are meeting, especially which ones are not meeting because I'll see that in one of the log lines in my API audit. And exemptions, like I said, depends on these three things, namespaces, runtimes, users, and then we, can, we will use a namespace exemption where some of the privileged workloads that are needed to create the cluster are put in cube system namespace. So we'll be exempting it because it would need extra permissions, but we want all the other pods that are running normal applications to have different set of pod security standards enforced. And next one, next two slides, uh, and then we'll go to the demo. So how do we create a cluster with pod security? So remember we, I mentioned we'll use something called kind, K-I-N-D, uh, and this is one of the configurations for it. 
uh, the, you can figure it out based on kind.x-kh.io. And kind also uses another tool internally called kubeadm, which allows us to configure all the flags and the settings that we have for any specific cluster. So here what the cluster configuration is saying, can you pick up the cluster level port security standard YAML file that I saw here when you are creating a cluster. So the colored lines that we saw is basically content of this file, cluster level psh.yaml. And so what kind will know if we set this is when I'm creating my cluster, I'm going to automatically enforce in this case, baseline port security standard. So for any pod in that cluster that I'm creating, you will have that pod, that pod would have to pass basically the baseline pod security standard, otherwise the pod creation fails. It will warn you on restricted and it will audit on restricted as well. And then essentially this minimal pod spec actually is going to work if our baseline pod security standard is enforced because we are not adding anything in security context here. Um, but it's going to work because baseline doesn't expect you to add anything. Anything that's minimally possible in a pod spec, it will allow, but because we have set it to enforce, it's going to give you this kind of a warning that if you want this to work when the restricted standard is enforced, you would have to set allow privilege escalation to true. You would have to drop all the capabilities. You would have to run as non poop and you would have to set a seccom profile. You can't keep it blank. So that's what it's saying. And then this allows you to then make those changes if you want it to accept a restricted port security standard configuration. And this is an example where it would pass a restricted port security standard if you really want to run it, which is something I would recommend as well because it's the safest way to run a pod if you're run using pod security admission. So lots of information, we'll jump to the demo. And, but if you have any questions, uh, I can take a minute to answer them before the demo. All right, cool. So we'll go back to mirroring. And if we go here, So pod security admission, and if you see here, so I'm gonna quickly check something. If I have ex existing kind kit clusters. So this might happen for you also. What it basically is saying is if you're using Docker desktop, your Docker desktop is not running. So I'll start it. And the best way to find that out is, this is the socket, Unix socket that Docker desktop uses. And if it's, erroring out there, that means Docker desktop was not running. So now it's starting up. It will also show up here with the whale icon of Docker. And once it's started, we will be able to use kind because kind wouldn't work if we don't have Docker installed. Same thing for anyone using Docker binaries on Linux. If the Docker server is not running on your system, you will probably get a similar error. So let's see this command one more time. And for folks wondering, like I installed a bunch of stuff, stuff later, uh, later I'm after the session, how do I clean it up? So the, the best way to do this is kind delete cluster name all. So we'll create about four clusters. If you finish everything uh, with me, uh, and you can delete them one by one just like this. So I had a cluster called all, which we will also try to install. And I deleted it. Now if I see get kind clusters, no kind clusters found. So now going to the pod security admission, if you see, we are gonna run this file. And if you are curious how it looks like, it's basically the same thing that we saw on the slides. So it's saying, can you create this cluster level pss.yaml? Uh, and then when you're creating the kind cluster, can you use my file? 
And th there are some extra things here, which is extra amounts and extra volumes. So essentially that is needed because kind is using Docker. So it would need to mount something in the right path inside a container. So no need to like worry about the details if you don't understand this. But the idea is I'm going to ensure that when kubeadm is going to create the cluster, I'm going to pass it on this config file that is going to let it know which pod security standard I want to enforce. So let's run this now. So kind with cluster level baseline pod security enforced. And if the, if the demo doesn't work, I have backup videos, so you'll be able to see how it looks like. So what it is doing here is uh, getting uh, a node created with version 125.2, where we can install and configure all of the things that we want. Uh, then it is writing the configuration that we set for cluster level PSS with baseline enforced, restricted warn, and restricted audit. And now it's going to start the control plane. This is the step that takes the most time. And this is the step most times if you're using kind where it fails. So we'll see how it goes. It worked. So now it's installing CNI, installing storage class, which is the standard thing kind does. Now what it's do saying is I have, I have a cluster that is created. Uh, if you want to use it, you have to uh, make sure that you set the config of kubectl or context of kubectl to point it to this cluster. So kubectl is essentially like a client. If the client doesn't know which server to talk to, uh, essentially the client is not useful. So this command kubectl cluster info context will tell the client go talk to this kube API server that I have here. Now the control plane of Kubernetes is on this particular URL with this port, we have core DNS, and we got the warning. So I'll bring it up a bit. This is essentially what we wanted to see. So we created that minimal pod spec with Nginx, and then we got a warning which said, oh, this pod violates uh, restricted latest pod security standard. If you do, uh, and because, and the reason is because you have not set all of the things that we talked about. But if you notice, it still ended up creating this, right? And if you notice, this was the part that we set to allow it to pass a restricted port security standard, and you don't see a warning for this. So the reason is because it is set in a way that the restricted port security standard would still work. And if you're curious how the pod spec looks like, you'll see this one is the minimal pod spec, and this one is where we set all the things that restricted pod security standard was looking for. So that's pretty much how you can use existing pod security admission to create clusters with something as simple as baseline, which would work for most workloads, but gives you much better protection than not having it enabled at all or everything running in privilege, which is basically if you don't have any container isolation boundaries. So that's the demo. Uh, let's go back to the slides and we will also take a break for questions. All right, anybody has any questions? Anybody needs help? We have a couple of people ready to help. Does this give you a better idea of what port security standards are, how to use port security admission? Yeah, go ahead. Um, how do I get the pod DSS? How do I get the? Oh, uh, if you run kubectl get pods, you will see the pods. I'll show you quickly. So, oh, I see what you mean. So, 
I can do like a get pod, but can I do something like get PSA so that I can see what is actually configured for in my cluster? I'm not sure if anybody knows, uh, feel free to answer. But es essentially the idea is anything you define in the cluster level PSS YAML file, that is exactly what the API server is using. So it's essentially declarative, go ahead. Describe pod would it would show up if you're using PSA using namespaces because name with PSA with namespaces you need to add a label saying for this namespace I want this particular PSS config to be enforced. But because we are setting this at cluster level, we will not see it in the describe. But if you set it to like one like we saw you will see like okay restricted was in one and this one didn't work same thing will apply for api audit logs uh, there is a good chance that if you look at the api server logs not the audit logs the logs of the binary itself in, on the in the system logs when the cluster is getting created and the api server is coming up you will see that it will try to basically hook into the config that we set for pod security standard and admission. And you'll see that reading the config from this particular file. So that will give you an idea that it is actually working or not. Yes. Nadir? Yes, to follow up on that, that um, in tech stuff I'd like to have a school session of it for you on this issue around checking the configuration of the cluster mm -hmm. and stuff that will say that it's the same config on board and then uh, there's probably been enough people to provide that for us for about two years now. So um, I think they're in the tech first, so they haven't been implemented. Okay, so for folks virtually, uh, basically our uh, experts who are helping us here uh, said a couple of things. If you are using pod security admission for namespace, you will see, you can use kubectl describe namespace and then you will see that label where you can set the PSS. Uh, second is there has been an issue open where we want to get a better idea of what is my configuration of an existing cluster for a couple of years. Uh, but uh, we, we probably need a cap and it's probably a great thing for somebody looking to contribute and familiar with Kubernetes to take it on and help the community. Uh, anything I missed, please correct. when pod security admission is in use. I do not recall whether that was ever implemented or not, or if it was just a thing that was talked about, but somebody could look right now if they wanted like to do a described pod on the pod that they just got created into their cluster and see if those events are there. Okay, let's because actually... If they are, then that would be an easy way to tell. But yeah. Yeah, so let's take a look quickly for folks uh, attending virtually. The suggestion was maybe it is already part of the describe output as an event. So if we take a look at it, we might be able to see it. So if you see here, let's pick the Nginx one, kubectl describe, uh, I think it's pod Nginx, let's see, yeah, okay. So let's take a look. Oh, 
Okay, so probably it should be here if it was implemented, right? So, so yeah. yeah, so it's not here, but we did get a warning. So that's a pretty good idea uh, or a pretty good indicator that the cluster config actually is working because we wouldn't have gotten a warning if it actually wasn't set correctly. So that's how it would look like. And uh, now going back to the demo, since we need to keep moving, let's go to the next task. Anybody added any issue in the GitHub repo? We can take a look uh, after this task as well. All right, cool. So the third task is about enabling runtime seccom profile. Uh, how many of you are familiar with what seccom filter seccom profile is? Okay, so, all right, so I have another analogy for you. It's a system call filter. Uh, system calls are essentially ways for you to ask kernel to do something if you are in user space, and filtering of those system calls is going to allow you to reduce the exposure to your kernel if you are running something malicious in user space of Linux. So. Linux, just very briefly, divided into two uh, roughly rough parts, user space and kernel space. User space is lesser privileged, has to depend on things in kernel space. And system calls are a way to move around between those. One of the fundamental things in container isolation has been seccom filters since Docker became popular. There have been very great uh, very important work done multiple years ago by somebody called Jesse Frazzle, who created a seccom profile which really worked for vast majority of workloads all around the world. And at that time, uh, as Jesse writes in her blog, she literally tried it for multiple images in Docker Hub and made sure that whatever profile was being created was actually going to work and not break things in production for anyone. So massive thanks to her. Uh, most of the new seccom profiles in new container runtimes are using that work and pretty much the profile looks similar. So we'll take a look later. The idea is when I'm going to block some system calls, I want to block the ones that are going to break my container isolation boundaries. So if you're a running a container, somebody else in your team is also running a container, you end up being in the same node. You don't want those two containers to be able to affect each other in any way. So what the first container does should only affect this container, second container shouldn't even know about it. When a system call could actually change the behavior of the other container, that's when we want to block it because then it's essentially breaking the isolation boundaries. And the reason you see the T and the saucer and the filter is it's if you make tea with leaves uh, or like dried leaves, you need that filter in between so that when the tea goes into the cup, you don't want the dried leaves in your mouth when you're drinking the tea. So the filter is going to remove the stuff that you don't need so you have a very smooth, very nice experience when you're having tea. Folks who make chai at home probably can understand what I'm saying. So for folks who are um, not aware how many system calls are, there are a lot, 300 and counting, which makes it even more impressive, the work that was done before to see which system calls would work uh, if we removed it uh, and the, when, whether it would break anything or not. Uh, the runtime default of a seccom profile is essentially what my container runtime is doing. So in the beginning, if you remember, I mentioned container D, cryo, and even Docker in the beginning when it was used with, uh, as a runtime for Kubernetes would have a seccom profile. Kubernetes long time back made a decision for things I'm not aware of to not use that container runtime profile as a default. So if you're using Kubernetes and you think container D cryo by default has a seccom profile, I'm going to automatically benefit from it. That's not true, at least not yet. 
unless you do what we are going to do in the rest of the tutorial. So the runtime default is a new feature which tells Kubernetes, can you use this container runtime's default profile for all my pods that are going to create containers under my container runtime? So as a result of that, it's minimal work. Uh, it is not going to break most things. There is no guarantee it wouldn't break anything. There is a chance it would break. So always, anytime you change any configuration in a cluster, the highly, rec high rec highly recommended thing is to test it in non-production development environments. Let it soak for a while. Let it run for six months with that configuration. And if things don't break, then you try to see slowly, maybe in one cluster, then second cluster, and then eventually have also a rollback plan where you can quickly move back to original configuration if needed. There are three other fields or the same for the seccom profile. You can set it in three ways. One is unconfined, which was the default for a long time, which is essentially don't use the seccom profile I have. Uh, second one is the one that we talked about. Localhost is another one where you can go really crazy. And there are some really nice tools about it where you can define your own custom seccom profile for any specific pod in your cluster. So as a result of that, many times the things that are blocked by default uh, are great, but you can block maybe more if you're using doing something simple as running a web server or running some gRPC uh, peers uh, who want to talk to each other. Then you need way fewer syscalls than you would actually need in a full-blown Java application, for example. So. You can do that with using something called localhost, which is custom seccom profile for any pod that you want. We won't go into too, too much depth details into it, but that is a good option if you want to advance even more the security in your cluster. If you haven't been using seccom, runtime default is definitely a good first step towards improving the security of your cluster. So, what does the default seccom profile look like for a container D or a cryo workload? So these are the links to it. Uh, you, we, we, we are slightly uh, behind time, so I won't go into details of looking into it. But basically, it will have a block which says which syscalls are blocked. It will have a block which says which syscalls are allowed. And that is the profile that the container runtime uses. Anytime somebody like a container in a user space says, I want to use this syscall and the kernel, uh, can, can you help me? And the filter will come in between and say, no, you're not allowed to talk to kernel with this syscall. That's basically what it is. And seccom filtering with customizing it looks somewhat like creating a pizza where you have a dough, where you have toppings, and there was a great keynote about pizzas in Detroit. So you can create pizzas that are square shaped. You can create pizzas that are circular. You can create pizzas with different types of cheese, paneer, mozzarella. You can make an Indian pizza. You could make a Chicago style pizza. But at the end of the day, everything is a pizza. So everything is a seccom profile, but your profile might look different than somebody else's. So that's basically how the customizing works. What we're going to do with testing isolation boundaries is it blocks many syscalls, like I said. Uh, it also, the default runtime profile also blocks something called sys underscore time, which is essentially something that allows you to change time, system time of your container. And the tricky part of it is if you change the system time in your container, it changes the system time in the node. So all your containers suddenly go back in time, even if you don't want all the containers to go back in time. And that can create some weird attacks uh, that you could do. Uh, so we won't go into what kind of attack would work, but that is possible and that's why it is blocked because it breaks the isolation boundary. So we look at one where we don't set the seccom profile to runtime default and see how the time changes. And we look at another one where we try to change the time and it actually doesn't work. It says operation denied. So setting up the seccom profile, this, is, this text is a bit small. Hopefully uh, you can still see it. The bold ones are essentially the settings we need. 
So the kubelet extra arguments, this is similar to the other one where we had a kind cluster, we had a cube ADM config. And if you see here, it's called seccom default set to true. And then another one for worker nodes as well, which is seccom default set to true. So, and then there is a feature gate called seccom default true. So all of those will make sure that it is by default going to point to the runtime seccom profile. And when you use it, you get the benefit of it in Kubernetes now. So the demo is gonna look something like this. If you try to exec into a container uh, that is running the default seccom profile and you try to change the date, you will see that it will say, oh, I cannot set the date operation not permitted. Uh, and if you check the date, it is actually not changed. So it's still what it was at the time. If you run it without seccom profile, it will actually change the date. And if you see later in another pod, so if you see forever asleep again is the other pod, it will actually change the date in that pod, even though you change the date in just the forever asleep pod. So that's big breaking con container isolation boundaries. We don't want that. That's why having the seccom profile set to runtime default is useful. So let's look at the demo now. So if we go back to the terminal and go to seccom runtime default, there are two files, one with and one without. So let's run the one with, uh, sorry, without first. And we'll do the same thing. It will create a cluster. It will use the configuration we set to default to the seccom uh, profile that's used in your runtime. And then we'll try to change the date and see if it works or not. How many of you are liking uh, using kind so far? Right? Yeah, it's really cool. I, re I really enjoy using it as well. Any questions while this is running? Was, was the introduction to seccom, uh, did, did it make sense? Any questions on that? Okay, cool. So we got the cluster, we are installing CNI, same thing, cluster info context. Uh, it's setting to the cluster name. Oh, you had a question, go ahead. Um, when you go with runtime default, you know, your standard session object detection, are there certain things that you can typically turn on to, it's something you want to do and it doesn't let you do, but you gotta come up with an exception, are there certain ones that you kind of wish they hadn't put in there, and how would you adapt? Yeah, so, that's where the previous task actually comes into picture. If we use privileged pods, the seccom default can actually be overridden. And so if remember we had three pod security standards, restricted, baseline, privileged. If we run a pod as a privileged pod, it will essentially run as seccom default as unconfined. So it will not be filtering anymore uh, using the runtime default. And as a result of that, if there was anything like ptrace, for example, which is sometimes useful and is blocked by default, you'll be able to use that if you run it as privileged. Another option is custom seccom profiles, where uh, you can customize the existing seccom profile, uh, create a file that says, I want this syscall, I want to remove all the others, and then use that as your default for that particular a namespace, then you're able to do that as well. Yeah, I, in my experience, personally, uh, the blocked ones, I hardly had seen to be needed for any standard application, like a web server or a database or anything like that. Anything that is available by default, most of the time works out. So we got this two pods now created, pod forever asleep, pod forever asleep two. Let's see if this is working. So, okay, I'm already in root forever asleep. Now what I'm gonna do is try to see if I can change the date using this command. 
So, so we should get an operation not permitted here. Oh, no, we should actually not get the operation not permitted because we are running without a second profile. So the date should change. And uh, if I go here again, the date is actually October 28. Hmm. Let's try again. And OK, so there you go. So the date has actually changed. Most of the times, uh, if your node has an NTP server, it will reset the date. So you're fine most of the times. But this is an example of like it, it can actually do it. And if you, if you want to see how it actually breaks the container isolation boundaries, we would do something like uh, running it in another pod and see if the data has changed. So if I go to this tab and how much time we have? OK, we are almost there. So if I go here and go to seccomp and do kind without, so it's the same command like before. What I'm going to do is, uh, this is already done. So we'll go here. And instead of asleep, I will set it to asleep2. All right, and let's see if the date is, oh yeah, so the date has reset. Let's try to change it here. So date is changed here, and date is changed here as well. So it's two different pods, but because you change it in one place, it changes in the other pod, which is not great, which is why it's blocked. So now if we go back here, exit, and uh, run the same thing with seccomp runtime, it won't even allow you to change the date in your pod. And as a result of that, you can't affect the other pods that are running. Did that make sense? So some of the things I was wondering about is like if I change the date and the license is set up for my software to expire after some X number of years or it cannot run for an older date than 19, January 1st, 1970, what would happen? So that's an interesting thing to think about. And you don't want it to happen to any of the pods we are running, and which is why having that kind of seccomp default is always useful. Uh, there are many other syscalls that are blocked as well. This is not the only one. But uh, in terms of demo specifically, this made more sense in terms of really understanding like, oh, I'm actually breaking the container isolation bounty here. So joining the worker nodes again, and uh, now we'll have another cluster with seccomp with runtime default. And we will be able to try and run the change the date again. And hopefully, we should get operation not permitted error. Anyone been able to follow along on their laptops completely so far? OK, great. All right. I see a few hands. OK, so this pod is now created. So you will see that this prompt stays there for a while. The idea is when you ask the pod to be created, you get a response that the pod is created, but it's not sometimes available because it has to go in the running state until you can exec into it. So I put a sleep 30, which is a random second number of seconds. And after those 30 seconds or so, most times the pod actually is running, and then you can exec into it. So that's why it stays there for a while. And then it goes into this patch. And if we now try to change the date, OK, I got the wrong one. So let's go back here. And oh, maybe in the slides. So copy, go back here, change the date. As you can see, it says operation not permitted. So that's the goal. And you'll see the date output still. But if you see here, the date is still old, uh, still the current one. So we can try again if it was not visible earlier. And if you see here, the date hasn't changed. So that's basically one of the ways we can do the seccom filtering. Now, this was the demo. And we'll take about 
let's say, five minutes break for questions, and then I have another demo where you basically end up setting PSA, SecComp together in one cluster. So for the, if we don't have questions, we can try that. Uh, otherwise, there is a script in the repo where you can try that. And one of the things uh, I'll share that I didn't mention earlier is by default, uh, there is a capability called capsis time, which also blocks this operation. So if you use restricted pod security standard, and if you remember back to some of the slides, it was saying you need to drop all capabilities if you want to use restricted pod security standard. So let's say for some reason you don't want to use SecComp or you can't use SecComp or you want to do it later. If you switch to restricted first and drop all the capabilities, and even if your SecComp is running unconfined, it will still not allow you to change the date because you're dropping all the capabilities. And capabilities is like a Linux term. What it essentially means is, what am I allowed to do when I talk to kernel? And there are about 10, 15 plus capabilities, if I remember right, which uh, give you a long, big set of permissions. So one of them is SysTime, then there are some other things, uh, like CapNet RAW, which is another somewhat dangerous uh, capability to use. So if you drop them with restricted, don't use SecComp, it should still work. If you use SecComp default, don't use restricted, it should still get blocked because even if you add the capability like I added here, uh, if you look at the YAMLs later, I added the capability. Uh, but uh, because I was blocking it in SecComp, it didn't allow me to change the date. So it can purely for system call filtering, you could work around it. You could use both for defense in depth. Uh, so it's really up to you. Play around with it. Both of them can work together. And that was one of the demos. Uh, but yeah, I, I would love to answer more questions instead of the demo unless people are interested to see the demo. So who wants to see the demo? Who wants to ask questions? Demo? Okay, all right, let's try that. So we go back here. I will mirror again. Oh, it's already mirroring. Okay, great. And if we exit, And then remember the cluster I deleted, that's the one we are gonna create now. So all together is basically combination of PSA plus seccomp. And there should be one file only. And it's gonna do the same, create a cluster, pick two configs now. One is the port security admission config. Second one is the seccomp config, which is basically saying, please use the runtime default seccomp. And with those two configs, it will create a single cluster and both of them will be set and enforced at the same time. So what we should expect is the Nginx pod, for example, should get still get the warning that we got last time. Uh, the forever asleep pod, which we are using a minimal pod spec for, it should also get a warning. And if we go in that pod and try to change the date, we shouldn't be allowed to change the date. So that's what we should expect because we are setting both of them in the same cluster. Okay, the good part I'll share later is most of the things uh, that we talked about, the official documentation in Kubernetes also goes in much more depth. Many of the things I've written myself in the docs and some of them I've reviewed. So please continue to use that as the reference even for future because I may not be able to continue updating the repo as the new versions for Kubernetes come up, but the official docs will always be updated because it's all community work, not just me trying to maintain it. So I'll share links in the slides for all the official docs for all the things that we did. So if you see here, we got the pod Nginx created, but with a warning, same warning as before. And what we should expect now is when we create the other pod, it should also get the same warning because we are using minimal pod spec just like this. And now if we go inside that particular pod and try to change the date, it should fail.
any quick question anyone has before we move on and wait for the pod to go to sleep the uh, the forever asleep name is basically because we are trying to put it in sleep because if i don't run anything as the exec for kubectl uh, the pod will basically die after it is created because it has nothing to do so we just put it in sleep so i can exec into it and then do whatever i want so it failed here it's now inside the pod so let's go up here again and uh, hopefully i have the date command in my buffer and if you see here it's not it's saying operation not permitted and the date is still the current date so that's what we expected that's what we saw and both of them are working together essentially in this case now back to slides i will extend it again and so we brought it all together we could do the same verification step before these two as well because it would work for any release that we are using then you we could create a cluster like we did with both together so definitely i would say try this at home when you are done uh, setting up all the three tasks one by one and see if it works uh, try to run maybe a sample pod that you think would work or not and see if it gets uh, whether you get a failure whether you get a warning try to play around with uh, ps pss different pss baseline restricted privileged try to set it up in different modes and see what happens and yeah try it around see if it works i am open for questions if you have any i would love to answer more and hope this was really useful thank you yes you had a question do you know what uh, kubernetes version seccom was enabled on you uh, the official docs if i remember correctly say version 19 is stable uh, but one of the things i should have here i i'll add it in the slides in the sked later there are links to the specific docs that cover all of those things and every kubernetes document will have at the top from which version this document is valid or not so we'll be able to take a look at it so if you have any questions or comments or want to say thanks or have follow up questions uh specific debugging questions definitely add issues to the repo uh if you have specific questions that you come up with later and thought i wish i could have asked if you are on twitter please tag me there i'll try to answer um i should be able to have some time until the end of the weekend and uh, if you want to give specific feedback for the session to cncf this is the qr code uh, if you found it useful if you found things could be improved i would love to hear from you for any future sessions i do with that uh, thank you very much and hope to see you for the rest of the kubecon lot of good security track sessions for the rest of the day and if you're heading back home happy journey and see you next time